Norman, what are movies famous for? Telling stories, Larry. Telling stories. Right. Both in front of and behind the camera. Behind the camera? Oh my God, I've got hundreds of those. <laughs> That's perfect, because today <laughs> we're talking documentaries on Two Real Guys. Hi, I'm Larry Jordan. And I'm Norman Holland. And welcome to The Two Real Guys. Today we are talking documentaries and reality TV. Mm -hmm. that, that documentary story is driven by interviews and narration. If you've got one, you don't always have to have narration, right? We are going to be writing the story while we're shooting and editing. Documentaries have two main components. Mm -hmm. There's the interviews and there's B-roll. B-roll. So um, is that a candy? What's, what's B-roll? B-roll is an old film term. Back when we shot things on film, you remember film. It, you remember it, silent uh, film. You remember when film was, we won't go there. Anyway, B-roll is an old film term that describes pictures that illustrate what the interviews are talking about. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing about a documentary is that you have to start with a point of view. Mm -hmm. The one thing that you don't want to do with a documentary is just go out and shoot something. Right. Because you don't know what you're shooting. So that's kind of like your story then. You're still building story. Well, if you think about it, the point of view is actually the log line that you talked about it in the very first episode. It's the starting point from which everything else is going to evolve. Mm -hmm. Then you go out and you do interviews, and the interviews continue to elaborate on this log line, this basic story idea that you've got. And you start. And sometimes it will change the oh, story. Oh, totally along, changes yeah. as you learn more, because as you talk to people, they add depth and they add breadth to your mm -hmm. story. And mm -hmm. so what you're doing is you're shooting and you're editing and discovering what you've got. You go out and shoot some more stuff and edit, and mm -hmm. so it becomes this iterative process over and over as, as we're adding on and on stuff right. to our show. Right. And reality TV, which of course has exploded. Every everywhere. It's a particular genre within documentaries, uh, and it rarely has that kind of formal narration that we're talking about. Um, instead, that narration is uh, handled by a host or a judge who explains to the participants what's going to happen. Or it'll have some very directed interviews where That's you right. sit and talk to somebody that just lost out or got thrown off the island or whatever, mm -hmm. and they ask very specific questions to get not only the emotional feel, how do you feel about being thrown off the island, but they also say, what did you learn and what would you do differently? Right, so well, what this means is that reality TV is shooting hundreds of times more footage than they need in order to manufacture that sense of reality uh, and more often than not, they are then manufacturing the drama out of it. And manufacturing is the right word, because if you think about it, if you throw a bunch of people in a room, most of the time they're well behaved and polite and there's no drama there. There's mm -hmm. no change. So what they're doing is they put lots of extra pressure on, they put lots of extra drama, and they have no idea how that's going to play out. So they shoot it with mm -hmm. lots and lots of different cameras, and then in editing we have to figure out where is the drama, what's changing, where's the story so going. So you use two words that we use a lot on this show, we've been talking about for weeks and weeks. That's change yep. and that's drama. Yep. And really when we talk about that, we're talking about storytelling. So everything we've been talking about applies here as well. I think the whole idea is, is that whether you're doing a documentary and you're discovering the story in process or you're working with narrative and you're writing the story before you begin to shoot frame one, in all cases, we start with a point of view, mm -hmm. elaborate that into a log line. From the log line, we take that into a full-blown story and from there, our program evolves. Mm -hmm. When you're doing the interviews, Larry, how can you make sure that you're getting the story? That's one of the things that drives me the most nuts because I've done a lot of interviewing and so many people have no clue how to ask questions. So the first thing that they do is they don't think about what answer they want to get because the question that you ask mm -hmm. determines the answer that you're going to get. For instance, if I ask you, Norman, do you know how to tie your shoe? Well, you're going to say, yes. But what does yes do for me? There's nothing in that answer that I can use. There's no beginning, there's no end. It's just, it sits there mm -hmm. like a lump. So, so when you're doing the interview, you're listening for a beginning and an end from your person. I'm listening to several things. The first thing I'm listening for is, is the answer complete? It's a self-contained sentence. The mm -hmm. second is, does it tell me anything that I don't know? If it just says yes, there's nothing there. So what I have to do is I've got to craft questions that are going to get the answer that I need with enough emotion, enough drama, enough 
caring on the person telling it. For, well, for instance, let me give you, give you an example. Mm -hmm. I've talked about the fact that we don't want to ask questions that require a yes or no answer. Right. Cast your mind back to your childhood. Mm, wow, I don't know if I could think back that far. Yeah, I don't think recorded history existed That's back right. then. Did but film exist then? <laughs> But remember you were working on a film called Sophie's Choice? Mm -hmm. You were yes. the music editor on Sophie's Choice. There was a great scene in that movie. And what I want to do is to ask a couple questions to illustrate what I'm talking about. Okay, bring it on, bring it on. If you remember, Kevin Klein was in a room. There was a bunch of reflections around in mirrors and he was directing this Beethoven symphony. Mm -hmm. And he was conducting as the music was playing. Right. And you were the music editor on that film. So let's start the interview. Okay. Norman, what was your role with Sophie's Choice? Music editor. See, already I don't like you. Because music editor oh, God. is nothing I can do with. I mean, it just sits there like a lump, quivering on the floor. Mm -hmm. What you want to do is you want to incorporate my question in your answer. Mm -hmm. And when you do, I'm going to end up with a longer, longer answer, which I can then use something with. For instance, if I say, Norman, what was your role with Sophie's Choice? On Sophie's Choice, I worked as the music editor. What problem did you encounter as music editor on Sophie's Choice? Uh, on Sophie's Choice, I had a problem with a scene that Kevin Klein was conducting Beethoven's Ninth that had been pre-recorded to a uh, recording that we couldn't use of Beethoven's Ninth. So in other words, he you, on set, you used one piece of music, and when you had to go back in editing, you couldn't use that, but he was beating the time to the music. When we finally found a piece of Beethoven's Ninth that we could afford to buy for the film, and it was at a vastly different tempo than the one that the sound recordist had actually used for playback on set. So how did you fix it? I had to go through each and every beat of the song and replace individual frames, removing them, lengthening them, in order to accommodate the actual movement of Kevin Klein on screen. That was not something that was done quickly. Mm. That took weeks <laughs> to do <laughs> at a vastly expensive salary. Notice, as I was asking you questions, every one of those questions were open-ended. Every one started with a why or how or what. It was impossible for you to answer them, yes or no. Mm -hmm. right. And when you do that, you end up with much more informed interviews and much more interesting stories because you're crafting your questions to get you the answers that you want. Yeah, it was. We'll be back with a tip right after this. Always ask your interview subjects to repeat your question before giving the answer. That way, when you put the whole interview together, you won't need to hear you or see you in order to tell the story. A documentary is where you discover the story as you go along, but you still need a story. Documentaries start with a point of view. Then you shoot the interviews to illustrate that point of view and add B-roll, which are the pictures that illustrate what the interviews are talking about. That's right. My name is Norman Hall. He's Larry Jordan. We'll see you next time on Two Real Guys.